Um, thank you, Tawana, and thank you so much for coming to San Francisco for this. Uh, How's everyone doing? Oh, good. Okay, I thought I was going to have to ask y'all again. <laughs> That's a good sign. So as Rachel indicated, um, I come from Detroit. And if you are under the age of 50 years old, you probably have had one particular narrative about the place that I come from. So coming from a city like Detroit, um, I'm always faced with narrative reshaping. It's, it's kind of like my key uh, form of existence <laughs> um, as a black woman from a predominantly black city. As an example, um, on the airplane, I tried to get some rest, but I literally overheard a conversation that lasted two hours about how despicable Detroit is. One of the folks sitting behind me was asking another woman why she was visiting there and what made her job send her there, and hopefully she didn't have to go outside a lot. And I have to share that because when I'm thinking of things like ethics or thinking of things like facial recognition or algorithms or data or digital justice or any of those things, I have to be um, very upfront about the fact that I have to uh, constantly carry a racial analysis with me. And so even though that's icky, and when we're thinking about math and science and technology, it's not necessarily something that happens in our day to day. You know, we're not always thinking about the racial demographic of the people that are behind, going to receive the coding and the math and the statistics and the science that's innovated. Um, I have to lead with that because I direct a, a data justice program and we innovate technology. But if I don't keep that, the human center at the focus, then we will exacerbate harms. I've personally experienced the harms of putting technology before people. And so before I talk any further, I'd like to give you a poem about Detroit, if that's okay. And then I'll get a little bit deeper into why I think I was invited here, which I'm honored to be here. And y'all are smiling, so I just, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, we were supposed to turn our backs on you. Count down to your imminent demise. Dangle you by the limbs of misdeeds. They wanted us to rate you inferior. Plagued by deteriorating neighborhoods and a convoluted history, you were never supposed to bloom from your ashes. A lot like you have been discarded like debris, deemed useless to naysayers and convictors. Yet you keep rising, clinging to vitality. You refuse to allow statistics to dictate your destiny, and the media will channel your journey. And though some shall remain loyal, others will mock your tribulations. You were combing a young into maturity. Both your gift and your curse, imported from adversity, you've seen better decades yet you thrive during the worst of them. Your best days have yet to arrive, and though some won't stick around to witness your climb or rejoice in your restoration, your destination is inevitable. You've been on the bottom much longer than most, and the bridges you'll journey won't be easy to coast, but you will make it. And bring warriors with you, armed with devotion. They will defend your dignity and honor your namesake. You are Detroit, the road to progression, the mirror image of endurance, and you hold the key to taking back our democracy. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to talk a lot about Detroit for many reasons. Um, not just the fact that I was born and raised there. Not just the fact that it's the last remaining black Mecca in the United States. But because things that are implemented and innovated in Detroit are then rolled out in other places where black and brown communities are living. So when they succeed in real time, face surveilling and criminalizing black and brown communities in Detroit, 
other communities of color don't have a chance in the fight. And sometimes, and, and, you know, coming to California is really scary <laughs> because this is like the place of innovation, right? And I love innovation. I have an awesome smartphone that I don't think I could live without, <laughs> honestly. And so I'm not here to say don't create. I'm not here to say don't innovate. I'm not here to say don't crunch the numbers. I'm here to say put some people in between the crunching because it's difficult to roll back dehumanization. It's difficult to roll back criminalization. It's difficult to roll back mass surveillance. It's difficult to roll back people dying because of massive water shutoffs, people dying because of massive tax foreclosures. It's difficult to roll back data integration that does not think about the stream and the trails that then take people dragging along with them begging for their lives. That sounds very morbid, right? But that's exactly what it feels like to be in a city that is hyper-visibilized and invisible at the same time. That's what it feels like to be in communities where for almost 50 years, people didn't even want to stop and use the restroom there. That's what it feels like to live in a city that people always ask you, aren't you happy? is coming back while all the senior citizens in your neighborhood are being evicted. They like to call things like that gentrification, but I think that's a too pretty a word for what actually happens when smart city meets racism. When people ask me, Detroit is coming back, right? I said, do you mean make America great again? I honestly don't see the difference in the analogies. Where is it coming back from? Where is it going? And who is it taking with it? And who is it discarding? I've always been told that I should grow up and get out of Detroit. Even as I watched folks come in, I was taught I should leave. I didn't have a critical analysis behind that. I thought what folks were telling me was accurate. I thought that where I grew up was inherently violent. I thought that the people who were committing crimes just wanted to be criminals. I didn't know that there were no grocery stores in our neighborhood. I didn't, I didn't know that. I was a child. I didn't know that African-centered schools that teach accurate history about community members and students were being closed by the, by the dozens. We only have two. We only have two schools that focus on African and black culture in a city that has nearly 800,000 black people. That might not seem important, but think about it. Think about waking up every day and not knowing anything about who you are. Think about not having grocery stores with viable food in your neighborhood. Think about 100,000 people having their water turned off. Think about not having recreation centers in your neighborhood. Quality of life crime is almost inevitable. If you aren't educated about who you are, you aren't taught how your ancestors survive certain atrocities, then you don't have a mechanism for surviving them as they happen present day. So I spent a lot of time using technology, media literacy, science, Math was never my strong suit. Trying to educate young people in the city to believe in themselves, to think of STEAM, not just STEM, to not become programmed into just being and funneled into a job system, to think of art and agriculture as a part of science and math and technology, to think that there is a difference between schooling and education. To, to know that there is a long lineage in history in Detroit of resistance, visionary resistance, of utilizing nature, agriculture, and all the systems around us to thrive and be respirited. It's really hard, though, because even in the lifts here, I was asked, isn't it dangerous where you come from? But I'm going to tell you this, I don't blame a single person who asked me those questions. Actually, I'm grateful when they talk to me so that they can know 
that there are people there who love, live, and breathe for Detroit and just want to do good in the world. And there's way more of them than it is people who don't. And I also want them to understand even the ones who are causing harm, it's because they feel violated. It's because they've suffered insurmountable violence through propaganda, through disinvestment, through abandonment, loss of land, loss of culture, loss of resources. If you put any demographic in a situation where they feel backed against a wall, they're going to come out fighting. And if you couple that with not knowing who you are, that fight isn't gonna be very equitable. So if I don't succeed in doing anything more today than convincing you that Detroit is not a blank slate, that smart cities need to think of people, that technology doesn't think of humans after it's innovated, that math and science have to go contemporaneously with art and agriculture, that low-income housing can't be $40,000 as a start when the median income in a city is $28,000, that 100,000 people without water is not just a decision somebody made not to pay their bill, that the whole entire city being taxed for clothes is not just a fluke of people just deciding they don't want to have a house to live in, that gentrification is not a harsh enough word for what happens to people who are displaced or suffering in quiet desperation. If the, the coding and the science and the math and the technology that you innovate from now on gives you pause in thinking about the innovations that you create, then I'll feel that I've done my job. I'll feel that you left thinking, Detroiters actually wanna be seen, not watched. I'll think that you left thinking, Surveillance and security is not safety. And I'll feel that the next time you see someone who looks like me, who tells you they're from Detroit, you'll be like, oh, I can't wait to talk to them. <laughs> I will have succeeded. I, was, I prepped a bunch of slides in my mind for this talk. <laughs> and then I said to myself, Actually, you're never home enough to do slides. And honestly, you love your city so much and you love technology so much and you really want to live and coexist with people so much that you don't need slides today. I just want to connect with you all. I really want to connect with you. I want to do another poem for you. Is that okay? And the reason why I want to keep doing poems is I want people to think about technology as something other than online. I come from a city where over 35% of residents don't have access to broadband. And so my opportunities to communicate with them must be vast. I hail from a city where the water is off. 45 from Flintstones, where they picking us off. They thought they had us cornered, but they pissed us off. Now we done come together. Who would have thought? I witnessed her soul slither violently away from her body. Denial. Pursed tightly upon her lips, she fixed her face to tell me she wasn't thirsty. That her babies weren't 30 days away from being ripped from her custody. I could sense deception in her teardrops. She was lying to me about water, fibbing to keep her babies near. She almost let me leave them waterless and I wanted to hug her, but I knew that her pride was the only ounce of protection she had left to muster, barely hanging on as if the reaper had granted her another chance if she could just pull herself together. Why do folks gotta beg for water, hiding behind scarlet letters spray painted to mark their negligence? I wondered what she thought of me, standing there with the fate of her family stuffed inside my trunk. I left three gallons of water 
and walked away. There'd be 10 more mothers for us to hydrate that day. I hail from a city where the water is off. 45 from Flintstones where they picking us off. They thought they had us cornered, but they pissed us off. Now we didn't come together. Who would have thought? Before I talk to you, I want you to understand why I do that poem everywhere I go. A hundred thousand people in Detroit don't have water. The solution is not smart meters. The solution is not tech innovation. The solution is seeing each other, understanding that we all have a right to live to thrive, to breathe, to eat, to sleep, to have water, water. We can't live three days without it. We'd live very horribly if we made it past three days with no water on our bodies, in our bodies. So, the next time, we code, we innovate, we write, we create. If you don't think of any other place but Detroit, I promise you that you won't have to search for ethics in your coding. It'll just be there. I don't want to drag this talk on. I want to talk to you. Is that okay? Anyone have questions for me? Emotional outbursts. <laughs> Just don't throw things unless they're croissants because I didn't eat mine yet. <laughs> and please ask anything that's on your mind. This is our this is our creative, safe, brave innovative space. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I would just love to hear a little bit more about your day-to-day -day work, what your organization does. Um, mm -hmm. Be really interested to hear mm -hmm. how you structure it, how you focus. There must be so many ways to approach these problems, so yeah. many things you could do. How do you, how do you make that decision? Thank you for that. So when I'm not sitting in the Board of Police Commissioners meeting yelling about what's already been innovated, um, <laughs> we, um, I, so I direct the data justice program for Detroit Community Technology Project, and we do a number of things. Uh, one of uh, Detroit Community Technology Project's uh, programs is the Equitable Internet Initiative. And so as I mentioned, 35% or more of the city doesn't have access to broadband. And so we are kind of like, um, our own ISP in a way, and we train digital stewards to think about equity in internet access. And so they go through a 20 week program where they learn about ethics in access, they learn about how to be, be responsible stewards of information, and then they go and place nodes and um, connect with businesses and residents on how to like farm the internet out to various neighborhoods. I'm not part of the integral day to day of that. I teach the consentful technology trainings and the digital safety and security trainings to that program. We also organize what's called data discotechs. Discotech being a play on word short for discovering technology. And they're kind of like these tech science fairs that we do in different areas of the city where we bring community members up to digital literacy, media literacy, um, help them to access the city's open data portal and to connect with how they can leverage the information that's on that portal um, through an equitable lens, of course. Um, and then again, we talk about 
census. We talk about anything that's pretty much relevant to what's happening in technology and science. And um, finally, I'll say one of my biggest fights right now is um, facial recognition surveillance in Detroit. And so I'm, I'm very intricately involved in that. And one of the programs, uh, Project Greenlight, that is um, a kind of mass surveillance program, which now has 570 cameras um, around the city, including traffic lights. Um, and then they utilize the images that they take from there and then connect it with facial recognition software. Um, and the reason why I know a lot of places are you guys are, I don't know if you all are part of the fight and resisting that, but California is kicking ass in that regard. Um, but it's very dangerous for Detroit to have facial recognition technology for a myriad of reasons. Um, it misidentifies darker skin tones, and we happen to have 800,000 of those. And so um, the fact that they are ramping up facial recognition um, and Project Greenlight, which has this flashing green light connected to it that's 24 hours a day, seven Seven days a week. If you live by one, it's flashing through your house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's uh, being manned by real-time crime centers where police monitor 24-7. And so i um, trying to slow that down right now um, and get them to remove those green lights. It's kind of like a scarlet letter, right? And if you know anything about the lantern laws of the 1800s, um, Black people, Indigenous and mulatto people had to wear a lantern, a lit lantern in front of their faces whenever they were not in the presence of white people. And so it feels like a direct lineage to that type of thinking and innovating surveillance in the city. And so we do more, but that's, that's in a nutshell right now. Hi. Hi. Um, your poetry was amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, I also love Detroit. My brother lives there. I'm originally from Cleveland, so I've been quite often. Oh, yeah. So S sister I city. Feel you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just curious how the programs that you're connected to, mm -hmm. in what ways are they actually reaching out to help up and coming coders mm -hmm. so that we can start initiating change with the next generation? Yeah, so there's a lot. There are pro, so coding is definitely not my forte, but um, we've hosted like the School of Poetic Computation in Detroit. Um, there's Black Girls Code um, that does a lot of workshops around the city, um, and so and I've traveled a lot to like masters in data analytics classes and different courses in universities. Um, all around the globe, but also anyone is thinking of doing it in Detroit, like we'll have the ethics conversation. We'll come in, we'll teach digital justice principles, equitable internet initiative principles um, that focus on healthy communities, respect of information, how long you keep things, why are you collecting it, um, just getting to the heart of why you want to code. Um, and so we'll have that discussion um, in those workshops, but we're not the we're not the coders per se, but we do connect with um there's um I'll give you a list of all the programs but we'll we do the conversation we push forth the digital equitable initiative principles and those different things that make you think of safety and not security make you think of healthy um communities and make you think of like not just innovating for the sake of innovating not saying that anybody is innovating for the sake of innovating but when you get into coding and when you get into science and when you get into data it's really easy to get wrapped up in trying to create and solve and a lot of times the conversations don't happen with the community members about what you're actually trying to solve and so that's what we do we foster the space for those conversations to happen Hi, so my name is Alice, and I just have a couple questions about your organization, and I just wanted to ask what kind of is the origin story of where your organization comes from, mm -hmm. what were, were there any valuable connections that you found, and then just yeah. what's like a short and long-term goal that you guys have currently? 
Okay, so my organization is part of a larger organization called Allied Media Projects. And so Allied Media Projects is 22 years old. It started off as like a zine fest, right, Um, like 22 years ago. And then about 12 years ago, it moved to Detroit at the behest of one of my late mentors, Grace Lee Boggs, who wanted um, Allied Media um, Projects to bring their conference, their annual conference, to Detroit. And so I work inside of Allied Media Projects. They hold an annual conference called the Allied Media Conference that you all should consider attending. But it normally has about 3,000 to 3,500 people there, all focused on way thinking about equitable data, right? Thinking about media literacy, thinking about media justice. How can we create information that's not inhumane? Um, and so Detroit was like a great place for this conference to be because it's constantly fighting against a dominant narrative. Um, and so our program came out of like some sessions at the Allied Media Conference where folks were like, how could we focus like more uh, intentionally on tech and data and digital? And so Detroit Community Technology Project was founded in 2015. In 2015, we also co-founded what's called the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, and then we started to build out programs so that we can think about access in the city, equity in the city, digital justice in the city, and then strategize on how we could respond to certain things that came up the pike. And so I would say right now, a short-term goal is slowing down the surveillance uh, situation in Detroit, a long-term goal would be ensuring that the city residents have equitable access to the internet, um, as well as just thriving, healthy communities where we can communicate with one another and see each other. You're welcome. Hi, Tawana. Hi. Thanks for sharing all your experience with, with us and your music and your poetry. It's Thank really great. Uh, my question is, you mentioned about data ethics as mm -hmm. part of some curriculum that you're teaching at your mm -hmm. institution in your community. Yeah. Can you speak a little more about that? I mean, do we have, I mean, in the U.S., some mm -hmm. of data ethics code that we can start referring to? Is it time for us to come together and write that one if we don't have one? Yeah, so, I mean, I feel like, well, being here is one step. <laughs> um, so we focus, like, as an example, on the open data portal, right? So you all, do you all know about your open data portal? So there are about 2,600 open data portals across the country, and most cities have them. And so it was kind of like this uh, way that city governments were saying, we're going to make uh, information accessible to community members, right? And so what happens, though, is a lot of times speculators and different folks who know how to read those systems end up leveraging that open data and not community members who could make use of it. And so some of the things that we've done is um, joined like an advisory board on equitable open data with the city. Um, we've given recommendations for equitable open data. Um, and we spend a lot of time like pushing digital justice principles, creating different principles to guide like different aspects of technology. And so our resource page is, um, is at Detroit Community Tech. Dot org, and you can find our open data zine, our open data to zine, um, teaching community technology, um, our digital defense playbook, which I was part of um, an organization called Our Data. I still am part of an organization called Our Data Bodies. And so that's a five city um, participatory research project turned teaching mechanism <laughs> where we go around and teach like different ways to think about data and technology in an equitable way. And we have a lot of resources within that toolkit as well. And so you'll find a lot online um, uh, on our learning resource page. And you can build from it. You can cater it to your own use. We also have a zine on how to organize a data discotheque. So say you want to pull together people and you want to organize this kind of equitable tech fair in your community, um, there's a zine and a how-to on how to do that there as well. Yeah. Hi, Tavana. Um, oh, my hi. name is Nalini, and uh, very grateful for your poems. Sure. I would love to get a hard copy if I can. Um, the question I had was, I've heard, like, so I heard you talk about justice mm -hmm. and the data justice. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the AIML community focuses on fairness. Yeah. And I would love to hear your thoughts from a community perspective on 
how do you see those two being different together can or anything about the difference between fairness and justice yeah so um it's complicated right because fairness so the way people talk about fair in relation to detroit is everybody has an opportunity if they just pull themselves up by their bootstraps <laughs> that's how <laughs> Keep that in the video. <laughs> um, but that, but you know, that's how fairness is talked about. Is like I made it, I pulled myself up. Why can't they pull themselves up? And so, yeah, I would love for fairness to to mean equity, but it, it typically doesn't um, because the race component is not centered and dealt with. Um, and so I try to cons consistently think of justice from an equitable lens. And um, it's not so much about leveling the playing field as it is removing the biases that create a particular um, disparate, disparate income, uh, outcome. Sorry, thinking of money. Disparate, <laughs> disparate outcome, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I mean, I could think of being a kid and going like, that's not fair, but it probably was, and it still was wrong. You know what I'm saying? Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, I'm currently a student studying cyber policy, and I'm having a lot of ethical insecurities around it for obvious reasons. Um, but I'm wondering, I know there's not one solution to this, but I'd love to hear your perspective on how in an age where we all move so much and we feel so mobile in America, how to support other areas that we're not from, other cities or other states, without kind of taking over and displacing the work that people there are already doing. Hmm. That one is always complicated, right? Um, right now, uh, as an example, um, Detroit, uh, just announced like U of M is going to build like an innovation center, like in the heart of Detroit. Right. Um, and I've done a lot of work with, uh, un the, with the university. I go there often, like it's a 40 minute train ride for $15. So <laughs> it's really easy to get to U of M. Um, but the problem with bringing innovation centers into a city, like I mentioned earlier, with like 100,000 people not having water um, and massive tax foreclosures, school systems. I, I didn't tell you all this. So 52 of Detroit public schools didn't have water all year because they discovered that the water was lead poison. For how long, we don't know. So a, a literal replicate of what happened in Flint, right? Um, an innovation center is not going to solve that crisis. Um, it's going to make it shinier and more beautiful for the new demographic that will fo inevitably follow. So I think that my approach is always to be in community with the folks that already live there um, and ask if there is something that community members need that they would they wish they could have access to. Um, whether it be research, you know, whether it be um, literature, whether it be hands on the ground, you know, or as we would say, boots on the ground. Um, but bringing a new, like, tech innovation center there right now feels very violent. And it shouldn't feel violent, right? Most places would love to get new innovation, new great things. It, it would make sense. But there's, there's still a very dire, drastic racial disparity that this country does not want to deal with for whatever reason. And it doesn't, and as you can see things play out all around the world, um, it makes no sense to not be centering those things in what we want to create. I don't know, I personally don't know anyone who wants to replicate all this 50 years from now, but yet and still, it's still the trajectory that we're following. And so we need much, much braver conversations. We need to roll up our sleeves and like literally just look people in the eye and talk to them. Um, and I bet you like that, just that, rolling up your sleeves and talking to someone, looking them in the eye, it drastically changes how you approach pretty much anything. You know, um, I've had some of the most really violently racist things said to me as an example. 
And aside from feeling fear from the folk, like certain folks, the others, I'm like, but why do you feel that way? You know, and I'm not asking everybody to like, just talk to people who, you know, say harmful or do harmful things. But once you have a systemic understanding of how a uh, opinion uh, came about or why a system is the way it is, then you can start to unravel it piece by piece. The one young man, as an example, who happened to be a U of M student, I was speaking at a class there, who said some of the things that he said, la- literally approached me when I came back for a talk a year later to tell me that he was now in the School of Social Work, that he had changed his political views, that he was now organizing talking circles around anti-racism. And this was under a year. And, you know, I know that there's many more stories out there like that of folks who just haven't had an opportunity to to have a conversation. And so we have to put the coding and the conversation like together, you know. And so I know I'm all over the place, but I get really emotional. Um, But hopefully I answered your question. And if I didn't, I'm totally around the next two days to have a deeper dialogue. Thank you. I don't know where my time is, sorry. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thanks. Hi. Um, I was wondering, so in the past couple of years, I think there has been um, a refreshing change in the tech community and in academia to really start to integrate these conversations about justice and fairness and equality. Mm -hmm. Um, But some, in some way, they're still kind of detached from community needs. And I was wondering if you could speak more specifically about the strategies your organization uses. I don't know, is it focus groups or yeah. conversations with uh, community leaders in order to um, find out what communities are actually interested in? Um, and maybe you can share some examples of programs that have specifically arisen from those community needs mm-hmm. rather than you know, outside people trying to impose what they think communities are interested in. Thank you for that. Um, I have the benefit of like still living on the east side of Detroit, being in Detroit my entire life, and um, having to think daily about whatever's created in the city is going to impact me and my family. And so um, just the ability to not disconnect has been very helpful. Um, Clearly, I can say I'm grassroots, but I also direct a program. So I try not to use that language anymore because grassroots is literally a little different than what I'm currently living right now. But I will say this, um, a perfect example of how community conversation meets tech resistance, focus groups, and all those things is this program that we're rolling out called um, Green Chairs, Not Green Light. And so this is a urban grower farmer in the community who feeds half the neighborhood um, with the food that they grow, who wants to get with us and organize an initiative in response to Project Greenlight to bring community members back to the front porches. And so they're this in about a month or so, they're going to organize this painting, these green chairs, or bring your own green chair, and then they're going to sit down and think about ways that now they can look out for each other. So as an example, instead of um, putting surveillance cameras up to watch children walk to school, people can actually sit on the porch and see them for themselves. Um, Just basic, rooted return to relationships, seeing each other types of um, innovations, right? I mean, the fact that it feels innovative in 2019 when it's literally where most of us probably came from um, is the knowing who your neighbor is. We're literally just revisiting the past. And so making sure you stay connected, like you said, to community members who are on the ground daily experiencing the impact of these systems um, is very helpful in thinking about the solutions to some of the harms. And so something's so minimal tech as a chair and literally sitting on your front porch and not going just straight into your house can reduce crime drastically in a community. You don't even need science to know that, you know? (laughs) And so, um, so just wait, those types of things. And, and again, the discotheques, the data discotheques are tremendous because they, we, um, hook up with a community liaison. So someone who's living in the neighborhood, they tell us what workshops the neighborhood needs and wants, and then that's how we cater the workshops. And so then we have them in different districts in the city. And so that's another way we collaborate. 
Hi, my name is Preston. Uh, I'm from the East Coast, a little further than Detroit, so I appreciate you coming here. That flight is no joke. Yeah, so I welcome. Know. I was like... <laughs> um, but I have two questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm originally from a small city in Pennsylvania. Uh, about a decade ago, we were one of the most surveillance cities per capita in the country, mm -hmm. um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And so two questions for you. As, as local governments start to um, have open access to data, um, mm -hmm. Simultaneously, they're also contracting out a lot of this data to mm -hmm. other companies. Mm -hmm. And I was doing a lot of research on you last night and saw on your website that you're also, that's one of the things you guys are fighting yeah. is transparency and open access to privatized data as well. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of uh, research on Uber and Lyft last year, and a lot of their data is very important to have to the public, but mm -hmm. it's not open access. Right. Can you speak to the work you are doing to get some of that availability to some of that contracted uh, data? And the second thing, Mm -hmm. um, so two big questions yeah. is can you also speak briefly about, um, as someone you mentioned who doesn't have a background in coding, mm -hmm. how it has been, uh, navigating tech and tech spaces. Um, I'm someone who works in policy, politics and organizing. Yeah. So it's not my background as well, but I understand the importance of, um, thinking of policy and, um, a lot of the repercussions of, uh, tech, but not working in tech directly. So can you, can mm -hmm. you speak to that a little bit as well? So two yeah. big questions. Sorry. Thank you. No, that's okay. I'll do the second one first. Appreciate so I have the, the awesome opportunity to work with people who all they do is talk tech. And so um, I'm pretty confident I don't want to know more. <laughs> but we benefit each other, right? They want to know more about what's happening on the ground. And I want want to know more about what's happening in their head. And so together we create more humane programs and processes. And so, um, so I'm able to navigate tech spaces because I'm in constant dialogue with technologists. Um, and so that's my answer to the second question. <laughs> um, your first question is, we don't necessarily want the information that they're privatizing. We want them to stop taking it, stop taking so much of it, right? And be thinking about like how long they're keeping the information that they do feel they have to take, right? And so the problem is the more, in, so I've been serving actually on a um, eth ethics and data integration work group uh, for the last year, right? And talking to a lot of city governments about like why there's just this big, swooping up of information with really half the time, they don't even know why they want all the information that they want. And um, there's no thought processes on when to delete it, you know, or how, you know, what the impact of all those systems talking together is having on communities. And a lot of city governments, especially mayors, um, anyone that has an equity, uh, trying to have an equity lens as a mayor, is starting to see the impact on these integrated systems and not being able to have thriving neighborhoods. And so the biggest, the, the maybe this mistake you made a decade ago preventing you from buying a house, well, that means you don't have, that means you're always going to have to be gentrifying in order to have viable neighborhoods. And honestly, that's super expensive. Right. And then you think about massive tax foreclosures, as an example, in Detroit, our mayor is trying to get another two hundred and fifty uh, some ridiculous number. And I can't remember the number right now. I think it was two hundred fifty million. Uh, don't quote me, but you could probably research. You could research it like you did me. Thanks for that. <laughs> but um, but he wants more money to tear down blighted properties when actually you could stop tax foreclosing on people and actually, and they could actually keep their homes. And so it's, it's one of those things where it's like the rationale behind collecting data and how we use the data is not making dollars and cents. If you actually allow people to pay what they can afford in water and housing, then you'll have viable neighborhoods. It takes under three years in Detroit for a very sound structure inhabited home to become blight to become an abandoned, scrapped property. Think about that. If that person was just pay paying what they could afford, that neighborhood would be vibrant. But instead, we have to let the houses, we have to put them out, displace them, let the houses dilapidate, and then ask to borrow tax money so that we can go in and tear them down and build. It, it just doesn't make sense. And so um, part of that is just like, hey, could you think about what you're doing with the stuff that you're collecting, basically? And it's an exhausting conversation, but it's one that, um, as someone who's lived in Detroit my whole life, I'd hate to see another city 
deal with what we've dealt with. And a lot of have, but we could kind of slow down a hemorrhaging some. Thanks. Hi. Um, so I'm curious about, uh, like, going back to facial recognition, mm -hmm. like, what the biggest challenges are in preventing it from being used in Detroit. Like, I may think it maybe seems a lot obvious to a lot of us in this room, mm -hmm. like, well, just don't do it, right? right? But I'm sure, like, there's a reason why it's, like, so hard to uh, convince others of that. So I'm curious about that. Well, I, I think other than the fact that it's, like, a multi-million dollar, possibly trillion dollar industry, that's the hardest part is that they're seeing um, quick returns on money. Uh, Project Greenlight, as, as an example, um, went from nine businesses to 570 in, in just two years. And so, and these businesses are paying like six and $7,000, um, I believe monthly for this technology. And so, um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of money for the city. It's a lot of resources for the city. Also, there's because there has been such a leverage propaganda campaign against Detroit for so long in order to get investors, in order to get corporations and businesses and new residents to move into the city, you have to convince them that you have the city contained. You have the residents contained. And so the way to convince the, them that you have the residents con contained is to pretend that you have the wherewithal and ability to monitor their every move 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you don't have that capacity, then you'll have technology that'll do it for you. And so it's one of those things. It's like, um, it's, it's a very violent uh, way of dehumanizing an already dehumanized populace um, for profit and, yeah, for profit. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. You're welcome. I, uh, was a little late, a um, little jet lagged, came in from Atlanta late last night. However, mm -hmm. so if I'm saying stuff you covered in your talk, my apologies. No problem. But what I caught as I've come in mm -hmm. is your your notion of what innovation looks like mm -hmm. seems like there's a lot of people who, who are cr talking past each other. Yeah. Um, and part of me thinks that what you described, for instance, with the houses, that if you reinvested differently, you would see better results. Are there projects that are perhaps pilot projects where you do use data yeah. to, to go back to people and say, look, this is still innovation, right? Because one problem as by the way, I'm a speaker later, so I hope I don't say what I'm going to say, but I will, uh, uh, is the notion of what innovation is, mm -hmm. with due respect to, to folks from San Francisco and the Bay Area, is, and I went to Cal, so you know, I, 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 <laughs> I'm not totally hostile at times to the area, but it, it comes and goes, um, is that it's very narrow, right? Yeah. Like when you said you've had enough, you're full of tech. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the definition of innovation is actually just newness, right? right? And it seems to me that perhaps there are folks who could use the social science as well as the data to work with you to kind of go to people and say, hello, yeah. did you see how this data shows this type of approach works with our people in a very positive way as opposed to, um, and the counterpunch would be, you're yet again just throwing computers in the classroom and we know that that's just silly right? because you're just deploying technology in a very thoughtless and actually wasteful way. Right. Is that opportunity available? And forgive me if you had a chance to talk about that. Oh, yeah. Well, I never have enough chances to talk about it. So, <laughs> But yeah, um, a perfect example is when they just decided to give laptops to all the students and send them home with no internet. Um, <laughs> you know, and so, so then having to sit down with the digital inclusion manager and the CIO of the city and go like, okay, um, they can't, that's like a typewriter for them. So, you know, so yeah, always thinking about like, what are the things that they think they're responding to, um, without having community input. And so if you have more community input, then you'll know that the things you're innovating, the newness, um, might not be so new if you don't 
put those things together. And so, yeah, we're constantly in um, advisories and town hall meetings and city council at board of police commissioners. Like we're constantly trying to reframe safety versus security and surveillance. What does it truly mean to create a safe community? That safe community has equity and access and humans seeing each other and not watching each other. And so, you know, it's, it's an exhaustive weekly conversation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a whole nother thing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes. We spent a lot of money on that, by the way. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.